Sure. Sure. So uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, yes, I'm Doug Davison, uh, D. Davison on the Fancy Grounds forums, and uh, one of the two owners and, and developers for SmiteWorks that makes the Fancy Grounds virtual tabletop and, and a few other little small things here and there. So uh, I'm not one of the original creators of Fantasy Grounds. I don't know if that's something that everyone in the audience knows or not, but Fantasy Grounds, a little history there is that uh, it was created originally in around 2004 by three guys out in Finland, uh, Villa Villa and Taro. <laughs> so uh, those guys did a great job at building kind of a, a proof of concept early on about how you could do virtual tabletops, and, uh, and that's where a lot of the architecture that we have today is from that original creation. And then at one point along, along the way, I don't know if it was 2006 or 2007, they put out Fantasy Grounds 2. So a lot of people will see uh, references. There's still a lot of documentation that, that mentioned Fantasy Grounds 2 or FG2. You'll see that often uh, online. Uh, and then I came in to, uh, I was an end user of the product. I purchased it back in 2008 when uh, I was looking, I was in Illinois and I was, I, I gained my whole life basically uh, role playing, uh, often a DM and a player uh, occasionally as well. And so I had a really, really good group of, of folks that I've met in Illinois and was gaming with on a regular basis. And uh, we were going to move back to my home state of Kentucky and I was looking for ways that I could continue and game with, uh, with them remotely. And I'm a, a software developer by trade, that's my uh, I have a computer science degree from the University of Kentucky, and so uh, I often looked uh, for technology to solve, you know, problems that I have or to create solutions to make things, you know, more streamlined and, and so forth. So I wasn't uh, it wasn't new to me to use software for an assist uh, for running D and D games and that sort of stuff. So I used a lot of software like character creation tools, and I used a lot of even. Um, You know, smaller kind of homegrown solutions that may not be you know known about or, or whatever throughout the years. Uh, one of them was like DM Genie. I used that for a lot of my games. Uh, I always like systems where you can modify and go in and do that sort of thing, where you can like change the system and, and and write your own little snippets of code or change the look and the feel or or how something functions. And so I found that right away with Fantasy Grounds. So I looked at Fantasy Grounds and I looked at I think it was Battleground uh, .net out there, and then um, there was Map Tools and um, I think there are a few other ones out there, D20 Pro as well. And so I looked at all those different solutions and Fantasy Grounds really kind of resonated with me personally. A lot of it was because like, I really liked um, the aesthetics of it. And um, you know, I've dabbled, at, at that point in time, I dabbled a little bit in some graphics and some art and that sort of stuff. But I was mostly a, a programmer, uh, you know, a, hard, a hardcore kind of like back-end programmer kind of guy, database you know, uh, person. And also someone who just doesn't mind going in and hacking things and figuring it out. So <laughs> I found Fantasy Grounds to be very, uh, very, very flexible. And so the first thing I wanted to do is I wanted to build a Star Wars Saga Edition rule set because that's what I was planning on, you know, running my group with. And so uh, I was able to build one of those systems, you know, just for my own use. And I was starting to populate it out and, and load it up with a bunch of images and putting in all the stats and the NPCs and, and that sort of stuff for my game. Uh, the funny thing is that I never actually got that game off the ground. It never ever took off. So I invested, you know, a fair amount of time building up this rule set. But it did uh, make me think that Fantasy Grounds was a very serious platform. I mean, it was very well thought out. It was very well planned. The architecture that they come up with uh, wasn't perfect, but was really, really pretty, pretty robust. Mm. So. Oh, yeah. uh, I was also, at that point in time, I, I had my own software development company. I was a software consultant and I would go into all these different industries and I would like, you know, build manufacturing, uh, you know, automation software, I would build, you know, stuff for the health insurance industry or, or for hospitals or whatever. And so uh, I had that company and I had, you know, eight employees or so at that point in time. And so I was moving to work remotely out of Kentucky. and. Uh, and I was thinking about selling that company because I was uh, didn't enjoy running it, you know, from one state to with all my employees in the other state. So uh, I ended up reaching out to the original creators of Fantasy Grounds and asked if they'd be interested in selling the company. And at that point in time, there was no indication that they were looking to sell the company. Um, from all 
uh, you know, from all inclination, it was they were doing quite well at that point in time. I sensed that they maybe had a little bit of burnout, like they were maybe not communicating as well as they could uh, on a few things, like new enhancements and that sort of thing. And I, I saw some other opportunity that I thought we could take the company in a little bit different, uh, you know, route. And uh, so we went back and forth originally. They said, no, we're not interested in selling it. And then we kind of talked back and forth and, and came up with a, you know, I, I started to get them to throw out some numbers that we could at least start talking about. And so once we did that, we went back and forth a little bit more. And uh, I also, at that same time, reached out to John Gregory, who many people on the forums will recognize as Moon Wizard on the forums. He's the other owner today. So I reached out to him because he was out there in the community. He had built a, um, a Dungeons & Dragons 3.5 edition rule set that was, frankly, better than the rule set that came packaged with the program. It had all these like extra little automation features built into it and was very popular. People were using that instead of the one that came with the program. Mm. And then um, he also was making really good progress in making a fourth edition rule set. Um, it, that's what ended up being the 4E rule set today. So I reached out to him when I was in negotiations with, with uh, Smiteworks, uh, limited out of Finland, and uh, just asked him, hey, you know, I see that you do the same sort of stuff you know, that that I'm doing as well, and you, you're obviously uh, very skilled at what you do. Would you be at all interested in going in with me and, and, and partnering up to make this purchase? And so I tried it. At one point, I got about 10, 10 people together that were all going to invest and pull our money and then, and then buy the software from uh, you know the original creators. Yeah. And so uh, everybody ended up dropping out. John was interested, um, but he thought the price wasn't quite right. So anyway, we... We ended up falling out, and I ended up buying the company completely on my own. <laughs> and then, uh, and then that was in 2009. That was in like uh, September 2009. And then in January, um, I guess uh, in between that point in time, there was also another small company called Digital Adventures out there that was doing third-party conversion. They made the original Savage Worlds and the original Call of Cthulhu rule set. Uh, <clears throat> and then there was like uh, a few other other ones, Iron Heroes some other sort of stuff out there too that they had built. And so they had some good relationships with like Pinnacle Entertainment Games and with uh, Chaosium and, and some of the other publishers. It was quite nice. And, and they approached me and, and asked if I'd be willing to buy their you know, uh, rights to their intellectual property and, and then bring that over. And at that point in time, I was completely tapped out. <laughs> I had zero uh, extra funds to buy anything. Uh, but we were able to still come up with something. You know, they... they they were so anxious to kind of get, you know, uh, they, they just wanted to kind of like divest themselves of it and move on into other areas. So, yeah. you know, I, again, I saw that as another opportunity and I, you know, found a way to make that work out. And, and what that allowed me to do was very nice as well is that on, <clears throat> on top of getting these relationships with these publishers, which didn't automatically transfer, but it got my foot in the door to talk with some of these different publishers, uh, we were able to, you know, get them signed under new contracts, new agreements. So that if the IP of the, the Fantasy Grounds conversions transferred over to me, that at least I could continue to sell those and support those those publishers. And then uh, on top of that, um, you know, the Digital Ventures guys had built a, a small community of, of community developers, again, like, like myself and like John, who were the people doing these conversions. So they were oftentimes other programmers like me who were just doing it for like the hobby of it and the love of, of creating these sorts of things or they were people who just loved gaming so much they'd go in and they'd hack and figure out how to make the adventures and how to do that sort of stuff so I also got <clears throat> introduced to a, a group of people like right out of the gate too so a couple of things like really really just all fell into place perfectly when I first kind of took over the company and then uh, I reached out to the community pretty early on and just you know shared my thoughts about the vision of where I, I thought the company would, would need to go in the next couple of years or so to be financially stable and, and uh, you know that sort of thing and where I saw the growth and, and where I saw where we can improve things for the end user as well because again my main motivation of buying the company was not hey I'm gonna get this and, and make a bunch of money it was that I wanted to be a good steward of the program and of the community basically because I already had a full-time job uh, and and was doing you know, my own thing that way. So this wasn't really uh, for that purpose. But you know, it's always kind of in my mind. I'm always trying to find a way that I can like you know make everything you know work out from from both perspectives. So uh, 
you know, that worked out okay. And then <clears throat> I reached out to John, let him know, um, you know, how things were looking after we kind of got, you know, up and running. And then asked him again, hey, you know, I know uh, things didn't work out the first, you know, time when we tried to go in on the purchase price, but I'd still love to have you as, as part of the team officially. <clears throat> and um, so, so basically, he uh, decided to come back on board after all. And he joined me in January 2010, and he brought with him his fourth edition rule set, and and just <clears throat> another cool developer that's that's going to work, you know, in full time. Sorry, Wrong. I got this like nagging allergy cold thing, so I'm popping it up. I love the four E rule set, man. Like we were saying off there, that's that's I love the four E rule set. It does everything. <clears throat> yeah, so a lot of that automation, a lot of the thoughts on how all that sort of stuff comes, that comes back from John's original uh, 3.5 edition rule set that he had made, uh, the JPG rule set, basically, and then uh, the 4th edition rule set as well. Nice. That's a, that's a, that's a, a great story, man. It, you know, that's I, I like hearing about stuff like that, how things start up, and, you know, I, I like to see how, you know, where something has come from and where it is today because it seems like fantasy grounds is growing i mean it really does because i bought it it's like we had talked about i bought it back in 2013 i didn't have the best experience with it and that was my fault because i was impatient <coughs> uh but you know since i started looking at it again my viewers were like man you really got to check this check out fantasy grounds too and i was like look guys i already bought it I don't really, I'm already got invested all this time in the, you know, Roll20, and so yeah. when I checked it out, I knew that night on stream, when I checked it out and re-downloaded it, I knew that it was a totally different experience from the first time back in 13, yeah. because there were so many errors with character sheets and, and just modules at all, and, you know, in general. And then the, the next time I, I purchased it, the Steam Summer Sale was up, and that's when the, I just killed the Steam Summer Sale. Yeah. Man, it was like I was like, oh, I got to get this rule set, I got to get this rule set, and then it's like <coughs> I know that now I'm committed. And then I basically took all of my games that I was you know doing four games a week I do, and I just moved them over one at a time. So I mean, it's, yeah, well, it's a, it's a, it's an awesome product, man. One of the one of the things that I that I see a lot is is we'll have. Um, so obviously, the, it's been in constant development. You know, oh, yeah. <laughs> from the moment we took ownership of it, it's been constantly developed. And and so a lot of that is is uh, myself and John, kind of learning how, uh, you know, the original creators that kind of put all that stuff together, got some Finland, and then you know changing a little bit. Uh, it used to have you know some issues where it would crash a lot more often as well too when we first took ownership. Mm -hmm. And uh, so over time, it's just gotten more and more solid. So. Um, but we're feeling that, you know, we're starting to get to the point to where we've gone about as far as we can go with the existing code base. We really kind of want to move it to a newer platform that'll be easier to support and develop going forward, and add lots of, you know, more kind of cool new features in it. But one of the things that <clears throat> that I see oftentimes is, uh, you know, it's the internet, and there's always a um, there's always pirated versions floating out there. And with a product that's as old as ours is too, the other thing is. Um, you know, there's a lot of bad copies of Fantasy Grounds floating out there, <laughs> and uh, that that we fixed issues way, 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 you know, a long time ago. Um, but I still see that sort of stuff floating out there all the time too. And and it, that's the part that bothers me the most is not even if it's uh, uh, you know people that you know if people have already bought it, all they have to do is re-download the the thing and, and run it, and it'll update itself automatically, just like what you did. Yeah. But the people that only ever had an experience with with the versions that are floating out there that are those uh, you know <clears throat> like version 2.0.12 is, is the the latest kind of hacked version that I think that has been floating out there at some point. And that's a bad version. I'm like, if that's what people's experiences with Fantasy Grounds, don't base your uh, your understanding of of what Fantasy Grounds is based off of that. I just ask people to, if nothing else, try us out. Uh, the newest, latest versions that we have. If you if you have the old version, just update it. Um, and if people wanted to like try it out for a month, if people are just dissatisfied, we give refunds like no questions asked, basically. So, um, and that's how it is on Steam too. And that, and they made that policy change, so now that's across the board with Steam. 
anybody can buy it. They can try it out and they can say, okay, it's not for me, you know, or whatever. Um, or, you know, what I would hope even better is if people have an issue, they try something out, something doesn't work right or, or it doesn't appear to be working right or whatever, you know, uh, we try to be real responsive, uh, both on our support at, you know, smiteworks.com and, and on, um, on the forums as well. We got our community members are awesome about solving issues and, oh, and helping people running and, and you know, so that's I'm great. I'm super glad to hear that you know some people actually got you to go back and try it again and stuff too. Because that was my viewers, man. I, they just kept pounding me about yeah. it, and I was so stubborn, yeah. and I kept saying, "No, I had a bad experience," and I was like, "Guys, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not doing that again." I'm already, you know, but I did, and that and that night, seriously, Doug, that night I was like, "Man, this is, this is what I envisioned it." You know, two mm-hmm. years prior to buying it, and I was like, "Yeah, this is, this is going to work out." work out really good because because you know i love fifth edition and yeah. you know it it's pretty hard to get a license with wizards of the coast <laughs> now especially okay. anything that has to do with the three letters vtt <laughs> because they've been oh, burned in the past about that and for fantasy grounds to get that license that's huge man uh you know yeah. so that that tells me that you know things are going good over there because wizards wouldn't have never signed up for that to begin with so yeah. coupled with that and retrying it, I was like, all right, let's go ahead and try this out. And then I just dove in and bought the player's yeah. handbook. And then I, <laughs> I saw how awesome it was, how everything was drag and drop. And then I said, screw it. And then I think like 30 minutes later, I bought like everything else. <laughs> Fanned yeah. over. And I was like, all right, yeah. I'm committed. And that's when I was like, man, I'm going to move everything over. So, yeah. Well, uh, even... I mean, even with that sort of stuff, you know, like even the fifth edition rule set, yeah. uh, just where it's gone in the last several months has, has been, it's, it's been drastically changed and updated. So yeah. we continue to add more things to that too. So, oh, yeah. I'm you know, by the same living. token, it's like, it's not, it's not a, you know, people, you know, sometimes, well, it's nice when we have, we actually have people who subscribe as well because that's like a constant funding of, of development. But, you know, uh, you know, we're we're not standing still and just selling one product and, and hoping we make as much money off of it. We're we want it to be the best product that it could possibly be and we know that there's a lot of stuff that we can continue to add that we haven't added yet. It just it just takes a lot of time to, to add those things in, but we've got a pretty good vision on what it needs to be and we're just working on it all the time. Yeah. Well that leads up to like one of my first questions is you know, you talked about yourself and Moon Wizard as basically <clears> being the, the, the two main programmers of this. I mean do you do you have any you know, do you have any uh, you know, plans on expanding the you know, your your crew later on, you know, with maybe adding more developers and maybe community managers yeah. and stuff like that? Yeah, definitely. Now uh, I don't want to say it's exclusively us because we have I think 26 community developers as yeah. well. So those are, those are all people who are yeah. paid commissions on development that sort of stuff. So gotcha. um, <clears throat> without them, we wouldn't we wouldn't have hardly anything in our in our uh, library like we do today. Yeah. And we have more people who are constantly approaching us and saying, "Hey, can I can I help out? What can I do?" That's and awesome. I'm always amazed at the number of people who are. Uh, you know, they'll send in resumes that are just amazing. You know, and um, you know they just want to they just want to work on it. You know, they just want to help and, and do that sort of stuff. And we have people that give us you know uh, offer assistance for completely for free without even they like we don't even I don't even need money or anything because I yeah. you know they're like I'm well paid what I do or whatever because these are like you know high end tech people and that sort of stuff who who uh, you know are just wanting to be a part of the community and help out and give back to the community and stuff too. So you know, th- we have a lot of those people, those people that do that. Uh, on the fifth edition rule set specifically too, uh, a special shout out to uh, Zeth Ponis who's on the forum to Zeus. Um, mm-hmm. People have probably seen him. Uh, he's been a tremendous help for uh, for fans and for quite a while actually. He did a lot of help with us on our fourth edition rule set as well. He helps us reskin things a lot. He's got one, he's one of those rare People who's got very high-end technical technical skills, but also a very good artistic eye and the ability to implement things. He's just you know one of those phenomenal people that uh, we actually tried to hire him, <laughs> but we can't afford him. He's, <laughs> he's damn good. So uh, you know that's the thing is is that some of these people that we're working with are uh, so talented that 
we wouldn't be able to hire those people full time because yeah. those people are a very rare commodity. And and we're just blessed that they, you know, feel like they want to share some of their time with us after they get done with their regular job uh, to to do some development that sort of stuff. But you know, we are looking to to probably hire maybe one or two people here pretty soon. I think because we want to get some other full time kind of resources in there. And we're looking at other things too. We're we're reaching out to a few other people who, uh, especially in the Unity space, to uh, to help us move things along a little bit faster. Because right now it's just um, you know John's doing a lot of that work on his own right now, kind of in a vacuum, and and I haven't even been able to to log in and crack it in, in quite a while. So it's <clears throat> almost exclusively falling to John on the on the Unity port. So. He's made a lot of headway, but it's a big project. So yeah. we're looking to maybe get some more assets in there and, and, and help and kind of push that along a little bit faster. So with the, you know, my next question is, you know, with this talk about the, the new Unity, this is basically going to be the new Fantasy Grounds, correct? It, you know, like a major upgrade. Yeah. Is it going to yeah. be called Fantasy Grounds 3, or is it going to have a new name altogether? Yeah, you know, we we still have to tackle that issue, and that's a pretty big issue to figure out. Um, what we've done traditionally is that every single upgrade to Fantasy Grounds has always been completely free and completely just like, hey, you have you have Fantasy Grounds, you have Fantasy Grounds. It doesn't matter. And technically, it's version three point oh point something right now. Uh, and so we've already gone from two to three, and, and that was a pretty big upgrade. But um, you know, we haven't completely figured out yet how we're going to manage that because it's a massive overhaul. Um, but we have a few things that we really are going to try to stick very closely to. So that would be, uh, you know, for instance, we're going to. Uh, sorry, my video is freezing up on me. Oh, sorry. Right. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we're looking at everything that we have right now, all of our DLC has to be um, supported in the new system. So uh, that's mostly just a data structure and a layout, and and some of that might need to change to, to do a few things that we want to do in Unity, but we're going to be looking at doing it as, um, if nothing else, an automated kind of conversion process so that everything can kind of pump through there and convert over to this newer version. So whether or not we're going to call that Fantasy Grounds X or uh, you know or slap a version number, it's going to be Fantasy Grounds 4 maybe or, or something, uh, we haven't completely decided on yet. Uh, I've, the, the idea that I like the most, and I've shared this with the community already, this is how I kind of envision it going, is that we will probably, when we get uh, much closer, like within within the point of being 30 to 60 days or, or maybe 90 days at most of actually having it pretty much released and ready to go, we're going to uh, probably launch a Kickstarter just to bring more awareness to Fantasy Grounds in general, more so than to actually like raise money and stuff. But um, we're probably putting a few lo layers there, which are going to be upgrade layers, so that if you already have Fantasy Grounds and you want to upgrade, you can just select to do that, and then it'll automatically oh, wow. upgrade. So, so awesome. one of the things that, that we're looking to do for that is that, you know, uh, yes, there would be a upgrade fee of some sort, but you know, we probably do like almost like a pay what you want sort of style upgrade fee, yeah. um, and then some people would maybe automatically get it. Like so, what we don't want to have happen is we don't want people to hold off on buying a license now because they're like, well, if I buy a license now and they come out with a new version, then am I just screwed or what? So uh, we definitely don't want to have any of that whatsoever. So what we think is going to happen is we'll have a window of time and we'll have like a pay what you want and it'll be like okay so if you bought an ultimate license or a license within the last you know six months or a year or whatever then you know you, you'll uh, if you just back us for a dollar on the Kickstarter then you basically get the upgrade or something uh, oh. but if you feel like you know it's worth more then we'll have like a couple other tiers and then it, it's gonna we'll have some guidelines and some recommendations on what we what we believe would be a fair one but we ultimately we don't know what everybody's individual situation is yeah. like I don't know if you used it once a month uh, for the last year I don't know if you used it four times a week or five times a week or you know only only you know how much value you got out of it you know yeah. so uh, it would not be right for me to try to assign what value you've already got out of the software and and uh, you know I think if we do that sort of thing, maybe we can have some kind of special unlocks. If we get okay, if we get X number of people that have selected this level, then maybe we'll be able to like throw out some some uh, free modules or new maps or you know that sort of stuff too. Uh, you know, 
chat right. saying they want Moon Wizard plushies and Smite Work sippy cups. That's there we go. <laughs> <laughs> That's part of the case. Yeah. That's awesome. That's like exciting little, to hear, man. They don't get those anymore, right? The, the, the hats with the two beers and the straws coming down, do they... Oh, the, yeah, that was big when I was a kid in the 80s, man. You know, everybody yeah. had those at the ball game. Yeah, now, see, because it's uh, RPGs, maybe it could be like, uh, you know, the Viking helmet and just fill up the horns with whatever your favorite. I like it, yeah, is. Mountain Dew or, or beer yeah. or whatever. Yeah, that's cool. Shoot. Yeah, that was going to be one of my questions was, you know, would we, you know, expect to see a price increase? And I, I think that's actually a, a, an ingenious idea to do Kickstarter. First off, I mean, Kickstarter is so popular, and, and plus it can actually help fund more advancements to the, the program, the, what's already going to be there for the core. Yeah. And I, I think, man, that is, a, that is such a great idea. Really? Yeah, it's almost a it's a marketing ploy in a lot of ways, and it's it's great for doing that because it just it raises the awareness so much. I mean, if you look yeah. at the <clears throat> the other virtual tabletops that have, that have kind of gone that route, I think that's how they get a lot of notice, you know, initially. Yeah. So about uh, about all this talk with Unity and Fantasy Grounds X and three and all these other numbers, can you talk about some of the you know the modifications that we're going to see differently? I mean, is there going to be like a like a SoundCloud involved? Are you going to implement some type of like WebRTC? Uh, you know, I've, I've had a, a lot of my viewers will say, hey, sometimes the screen gets a little bit cluttered. You know, are, are, are there going to be better map making tools to where you can actually take tile sets like in other competitors to where you can yeah. lay these tile sets down, work on them in different layers and whatnot? Uh, and I actually also saw in the forum somewhere that there's going to be animated spell effects possibly in, in the new in the new fantasy grounds. Yeah, so Unity is such a, a much more sophisticated package than, than basically you know what we're using right now. And with Unity comes all these extra libraries as well that we can tap into very easily. There's basically a, a plugin mentality that you can you can pick up a plugin. So it basically it doesn't do all the work for you. It's not like you just select from a thing and say, oh, add spell animations, add this, add whatever. Yeah. But, <clears throat> It'd be nice if it was like that, though, wouldn't it? Yeah, it would be kind of cool. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but what it does do is it cuts out a lot of the development time. So then you don't spend the time developing all this really cool stuff. What you do instead is you spend the time integrating those really cool things that are already built into something else that's already there. So there's already stuff like there's already SoundCloud cloud kind of plugins and that sort of stuff uh, for doing like streaming of multiple channels of sound and, and linking sounds up with, with things already. That stuff's kind of already natively supported in uh, in Unity. And so then that stuff all becomes possible and, and we, we're still, like I said, we're still working on you know the plumbing, a lot of the plumbing sort of issues, which is uh, kind of code speak for uh, you know all the boring sort of behind the scenes sort of stuff. But even that stuff to me has got some exciting features. You know, the idea of doing um, a cloud-based sort of a of a campaign to me is, is really intriguing because it gives you a lot more opportunities. You know, a lot of people are restricted by their upload speeds, and so uh, right now the way the architecture is set up, and people may not realize the you know the importance of this sort of thing, but it's a peer-to-peer -peer architecture, which uh, when I host a game as a GM, I've got six people then I'm sending data out to six different people whenever I push a map out. Yeah. And so what a cloud-based kind of architecture would allow us to do is it would allow us to send that up, you know, from your from the GM would send it to one place. And then from that one place, it would then distribute it out. So it's uh, nice. uh, kind of similar to like a cash de uh, delivery network, which is, is what we use for like our website to do stuff. Um, you know, it's got geosynchronous, um, uh, you know, locations all throughout all throughout the uh, the globe, basically, that distribute the same sort of content out and, nice. and makes it a lot faster and, and more stable. <clears throat> and then that also then opens up other options. Like one of the things that people have often asked is is uh, being able to pass the GM mantle around so that, you know, if you have this ultimate license or whatever, then maybe you could even share that with another GM or something. Now, you know, uh, I just responded to someone that, that asked that sort of question on uh, the Steam forums just the other day. And that also raises some other um, things that we have to consider, just because you know we have to make sure that okay, well, are we? Is this going to cause us any issues with um, 
with content sharing and that sort of stuff that our publishers may or may not like. So we have to look at it, you know, not just from a technical standpoint, hey, can we do this technically, but can we do this technically and can we do this in a way that also supports our partners and doesn't break any of our agreements with our publishers and that sort of stuff too. So, um, you know, but, you know, the fact that the technical aspect is going to be possible is, uh, you know, makes it might, makes it much, much nicer. So some things that, that I'm really interested in, and, and none of these things are going to come right away. I mean, what we're going to have happen is that we're probably going to get a relatively basic version up on Unity, which will look very similar to what we do today. Uh, may even have a few things that are broken for custom rule sets people have built or whatever that'll take us a little bit of time. So we're going to go into a, a, a basic release, try to get that as stable as possible, try to make sure that everybody can do the stuff that they can do today. <clears throat> Maybe add a couple different new features that people will be excited about that will make it worth them going through this process of, okay, now I have to have things change around a little bit and figure out how to do things you know, in this new interface. But once, once we've made it a little bit down the road with that, then we can start looking at putting in the stuff like the SoundCloud. Um, we could do stuff like integrated video and chat and voice and that sort of stuff too so that you can have your, your video cameras set up if you, if you want to. Maybe that'll be an option uh, we're playing around with. We're also talking about the maps. Um, really cool stuff with maps. Uh, actual dynamic lighting, uh, you know, looking for uh, vision blocking and that sort of stuff. Some things that, that I think we can do in that space uh, doesn't make sense for us to build that out in our existing architecture because it's going to be completely different when we get to Unity. So we're uh, holding it off for then. We've got some really nice new dice mechanics that uh, will definitely be in there. So it's going to support more, uh, you know, kind of standard dice uh, nomenclature. So you should be able to, to, with just the dice chat commands, that sort of stuff, with the people that are making the core RPG based rule sets. We'll be able to handle any kind of dice mechanic that, that's out there in the wild, nice. basically for RPGs, just kind of more natively out of the box. Uh, the other things are, uh, I don't know if you've looked much on the hex grids, but the hex grids and the uh, square grids and the movement and, and that sort of stuff, yeah. we can do oh, yeah. a lot more with pathfinding. We've already prototyped out some really cool stuff with that, oh. uh, even elevation. So you could even do, uh, I don't know if you play like Final Fantasy Tactics and that sort of stuff, where you even have like the different yeah. tiles or... Uh, yeah, some sort of like X, Y's, there. right? Yeah, yeah, so you, you end up with, with, yeah, you got your X, Y's and your Z's and that sort of stuff too. So that sort of stuff, being able to rotate the map around to, to have isometric views, um, oh, even with crap. 3D sort of uh, uh, tokens. So one of the things we did, we, we were originally going to partner with, uh, I don't know if people have seen it, the 3D Virtual Tabletop, which has a really nice looking interface that's very you know uh, specific in what it does. It shares a map and tokens and stuff, and that's mm -hmm. that's pretty much all it does. But uh, that same philosophy is one that we, uh, you know, we were exploring as well, which is basically we have this existing library of all these tokens and artwork and that sort of stuff, a lot of tokens of, of you know figurines and that sort of stuff, which we have in a 2D format that that lay flat, almost like a square, yeah. you know, on a on a map, and they move around. But the nice thing is that you can take that, you can flip it up, put it on like a, a stand up sort of a thing, but but make that a three D object that can be moved around. And then that way, you, you suddenly have uh, an isometric nice. view, much like you would have with you know with nice. uh, like the Pathfinder pond. Yeah, that was, that's what I was fixing to ask the Pathfinder Beastiery, you know, pogs with the little stands. Man, that's amazing. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean that kind of stuff, it, it opens a lot of doors and then it also opens the ability to even do full 3D rendered things as well. And so I don't know what sort of options we'll have with that. You know, one of the things that I see is that, you know, the big players like Wizards of the Coast, they actually have, you know, 3D objects that they've sent out and, and got sculpted and, and made miniatures for. So I don't know if this is ever going to be a possibility, but, you know, just the thought of it is, is kind of interesting and yeah. exciting. It's the, uh, you know, could we even take those and, and take those original 3D, you know, designed uh, objects, and could we put them into a digital format that people could use too? So that you know, just like the miniatures that you have at the table, you're actually moving the real miniatures around and doing that sort of stuff. And <clears throat> I played around with one; it's not quite uh, granular enough yet, but I've got this thing called Structure Sensor, which is a 3D scanner that you can hook up to. Uh, you actually hook it to your iPad. And so what it does is it has a camera here and it has an a infrared scanner here and it takes an infrared which basically fully 3D maps an object and then simultaneously it takes the camera and it paints it with, uh, wow. with actual color. 
And so it works great for like humans and, and objects that are like the size of like you know like a cup, cup or whatever, um, but doesn't quite work yet for the, the you know smaller 25 to 28 millimeter kind of range. Doesn't have it doesn't grab all that detail yet, but it's yeah. it's getting really really close. And so uh, definitely longer term, I mean that stuff's just going to keep getting better and better and better. Oh, and I could see doing that sort of stuff where you can like scan in an object, put it in. You know maybe we'll maybe we'll build some like custom little hardware to like. You know, rotate it around and take all the little points, and then you know, map out a 3D object that you can do. And I would love to have all my miniatures in a digital format because when I run, I've got I don't know how many thousands of little plastic figures, but finding the damn figure I need if I'm trying to do something on the fly is almost impossible. Yeah, that's, <laughs> so, that's the same thing with me. I'm looking through Tupperware bins to try to find something. Yeah, so. and you, once you get too many, it's just it, it's not really usable anymore. And then you never have as many as what the adventure calls for. If you run any of the like straight out of the book ones, you're like, oh, I need eight of these guys, and I've got yeah. five or yeah. you know, whatever. So you end up, you know, processing figures in yeah. and that sort of stuff. And and so the the <laughs> idea of doing a 3D, uh, you know, object in a digital format that you could just say, you know, plug in however many you need and uh, awesome. <clears throat> kind of go that route would Pret be sweet. Pretend these eight orcs are twelve goblins, and yeah, oh yeah, yeah. when they're done, that man. Oh yeah. So, man, sounds awesome. Some of the features. I mean, uh, so what? T what kind of time frame are we looking for? For you know, the new Fantasy Grounds or Fantasy Grounds X or three or ten or four. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, that's a really difficult question. And if I, I know if I throw any sort of date out there, uh, John's gonna get pissed off at me. Uh, so I, I'll yeah. kind of pull back from doing that. <clears throat> All I'll say is that progress is continuing. It's uh, it's come a long way. But we have we kind of took a step back to get some of the plumbing sort of stuff done. So early on, and I released a couple early like uh, screenshots of a few things we were prototyping out. Mm -hmm. Those things uh, look beautiful, and you got up and running really pretty quickly. But the problem with that sort of stuff is, and and this is something that uh, people in, in programming development uh, understand, is that sometimes you can look like you're ninety percent of the way there, and and you're actually much 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 lower. Yeah. Um, so we've kind of flipped that around a little bit. Now we're going back and we're working on all that sort of stuff before we start showing too many more, you know, kind of screenshots and that sort of stuff. So we're going to put the screenshot stuff in at the last minute, uh, you know, once once we're very very far along. Um, so I would say it's definitely 2016. There's nothing in 2015 that's going to hit. Yeah. We're right now we're trying to to manage that with uh, some changes and some updates that we need with the fifth edition and with the other rule sets. And uh, <clears throat> so John's looking at doing another patch right now for, uh, excuse me, the, the existing engine, which has got some pretty cool little features in that too, uh, coming out. And uh, and that's going to have some enhancements for fifth edition that will help us with like the dungeon master guide and some of those things too. So mm -hmm. um, so we're, we're kind, of, kind of having to hop back and forth a little. Bit. And like I said, we, we're a little bit light on resources. Um, Especially with two people, you know. It's yeah, yeah. And Zeus was helping us out a bunch, and, and then he's kind of uh, gotten pulled away, you know, with real life uh, for a while too. So you know, we ended up kind of shrinking a little bit more as well. So that's why we're looking to hire some people. But you know, whenever you hire someone uh, with something like this, they've got a lot of learning to do before they can, uh, you know, contribute anything necessarily either. So, yeah. so we're probably looking at. <clears throat> I would say uh, it's not out of the question that it's still going to be maybe even summer 2016 or so before we're ready to really you know launch a Kickstarter and then right kind of go from there. Well, so, that sounds good, man. I wish it was sooner. I wish it was sooner, but we're, you know, uh, we're making it. you don't want to rush it out either, you know what I mean? Because yeah, yeah, yeah. A, a lot of bad things can happen when, when you do rush things out, and you, you don't want to do that. So exactly. I would rather wait and, and have something, uh, a polished product than than something that was rushed out and you know not be what I expected. So, and, and we've seen people do Kickstarters way too early too, and, and it just bites them in the butt every time because people get uh, <laughs> people get really yeah. pissed off when yeah. when they have to wait like a year or two years or whatever to get with it. What they have a couple. Kickstarter. So we're we're gonna try our best not to do that. I mean, nothing is is ever guaranteed in software development. Um, you know that. <clears throat> My wife would often ask me when I'd be doing a programming project and I'd be working like late at night or whatever. She'd call me, "Are you coming home yet?" I'm like, "Oh no, I got to finish this one more thing." And she'd ask, "How long?" And I'm like, "Well, maybe another hour." And then like three or four hours would roll by, and she called me back, "How are you? Are you coming home?" <laughs> so, yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, things just, it, it takes as long as it takes, unfortunately, and that's never a fun answer to give to people, but uh, we'll get there. Oh, so that's cool. So about, uh, you know, to, to kind of get away from, from Unity, and I know definitely a lot of people are probably going to ask some more questions on that. You know, about uh, new publishers and stuff, you know, you got Wizards of the Coast, and, and you know, I, I know that you've got uh, quite a few Savage Worlds, Deadlands uh, <coughs> items on there. So are yeah. there any, uh, are there any, like, publishers that you're working with currently that you're trying to hash things out with like maybe a Green Ronin with Fantasy Age or maybe a, a Numenera with Monty Cook Games because I, I know that you can play Numenera <coughs> already you know but that yeah. was a question that I asked on the, the forums the other day uh, so what you know what kind of other yeah. publishers could we be expecting to possibly maybe see in the future uh, you know, that's a, good, that's a good question. So the one that I, I think it's already known is uh, Sasquatch Games. Uh, they did the, the fifth edition, uh, um, the Prince of the Apocalypse, but they actually have their own stuff coming out for fifth edition that's compatible. It's called Primeval Tool. And so, uh, you know, that's one of the ones that we've got an agreement in place for them. And so that's, right now, that's only going to be available on Fantasy Grounds too. So that's also, uh, you know, something that we're excited about. Um, as far as new publishers, I've got a bunch of kind of smallish publishers out there that are wanting to get some stuff onto the market that, you know, they've been sending me stuff and their stuff looks great. Uh, it's just a matter of kind of, uh, I've got to do the curation of it and make sure that it, you know, it's all good and, and uh, you know, test it and maybe work back and forth with them a little bit. Then i got to set them up with all the contracts and then get them into our store and push that out there. But uh, there's going to be a couple of, like really small stuff, but no real big name publishers really at this point are are uh, in the works. I'd say um, Catalyst Games is is one that we've uh, done a little bit of stuff with that uh, I'm hopeful that we'll be able to get for Shadowrun, um, but I'm not sure if we'll be able to do that or not yet. So, um, you know, basically we had a community de a community developer who's done a lot of uh, you know done a couple other projects for us that basically built out. Uh, a pretty robust Shadowrun, um, you know, rule set, and uh, so we sent that over to the, to the folks at Catalyst to try out. But um, <clears throat> that's we would love to get that in place, you know, as as a new license because especially with uh, the stuff that the Hairbrain Scheme guys uh, are doing with um, you know with the actual video games out on Steam that are based in the Shadowrun world, you know, that sort of stuff. I think there's a there's a big draw for that. Some of the other big licenses we'd like to do too. Um, obviously, the Star Wars, like Edge of the Empire, that sort of stuff, we would love, love, love to get. Um, it's it's always complicated when you have multiple licensees in place, um, and you've got you know one company who's already licensing it from you know the Star Wars basically is already getting licensed, and then to turn around and try to license that to somebody else gets really complicated really fast. So yeah. I don't know if that's something that anybody's going to be able to crack. Um, just because you know, it, when you take a pie, you start cutting it too many, in too many pieces, then people lose interest pretty quickly about you know wanting to, to do something there. And, and it just you have to get lawyers involved from like multiple groups of folks to sign off on stuff, and you know it, it doesn't always work out. But um, uh, what sort of what sort of game? I, I'll throw it back to you and to the community. What sort of games are people really, really hankering for the most that, uh, that I should be aware of? Say, yeah, a lot of people are saying Warhammer and uh, oh yeah, Warhammer Marvel superheroes. I guess that Marvel superheroes is Green Ronin. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we actually have a relationship with Green Ronin for like mutants and masterminds right now. Uh, they got their bestiary in there as well, the, the Pathfinder bestiary. Yeah, the, the advanced bestiary, I worked on that one. Uh, the Mutants and Masterminds, we had another community developer put that out. Uh, it turned out pretty good, but we really need to, to get another de developer, I think, in there to help uh, that really knows that system very well so that we can kind of do some more updates to it and, and roll out some of their uh, you know, their threat reports and some of that sort of stuff. So I think Green Ronin's open to us doing some other things. Now with Marvel... Uh, again, that prevents that presents that same kind of yeah. problem where uh, you're not just dealing with Green Ronin. You have to get Green Ronin to also, you know, uh, explain the situation to Marvel and figure out how that works for all parties and stuff. Yeah. So that one, I would love to have that. I mean, that'd be badass. Um, They're saying one ring with I don't know. multiple people. 
Cubicle 7s, uh, mm-hmm. the new One Ring. I know that there's a really nice plug-in right now on the forums for the One Ring for through Core RPG. <coughs> and there's mm-hmm. a new Conan RPG, there's Paizo, you know, with uh, Pathfinder itself. Um, yeah, now Paizo, uh, I've reached out to Paizo year after year after year. We would love to get in with them, too. Uh, it hadn't happened yet. Uh, I'm still hopeful that one of these days it will. Yeah. So I, I would say if people are interested with that, they could probably help out in that situation by you know asking about it on the Paizo forum and try to you know bring it up more and more there. Um, because you know I think if they realize that there's as much demand as I think there is for it, then uh, you know they're really pretty good about meeting the demands of the of their consumers and their community. So. Uh, you know, and I think we could do a great job with that. I'd love to see the adventure paths in there. And so we already have like, you know, there's a lot of a lot of it's OGL, so it's already got pretty strong support for for Pathfinder already. And with you know, the community is able to build modules and share modules because they're full of just OGL stuff. As long as they have the OGL license uh, content in there, they're able to kind of do that pretty freely. So uh, you can already pretty much even running the adventure paths right now is is not bad on fancy grounds. You just have to basically do the maps. Um, you know, scan the map center or whatever, but you know, all your NPCs are already pre-statted out for you, so th- so that's kind of nice. I think it'd be pretty easy for us to spin up the adventure pass for Paizo. Do you have any kind of statistics on what are the most popular games on on Fantasy Grounds that are played? Yeah, I do, and, and uh, I don't know if I let's see if I have them here. I, I, I've shared that out with like Ian World a couple times, and um, I don't know if you've ever seen those, but. Yeah, we we do record whenever there's whenever basically we get uh, a game launched through the Alias Engine. Uh, you know, you know the four word name that people basically get assigned for their yeah. system. So, <clears throat> whenever that happens, it it does write a transaction to our database, which tells us like the rule set um, and the IP address because we have to know the IP address to you know connect people when they try to plug in that same four uh, word number. So. We have some some basic statistics. It's not real in depth, but uh, we've pulled those numbers a couple times in the past, and uh, not surprisingly, you know, we've got uh, tons and tons of different games that are being played out there. But by far, percentage-wise, the D and D just trumps all. D and D and Pathfinder, and you know, the different variants of D and D. So you got D and D three point five, you got D and D fourth edition. Fifth edition, you know, and and Pathfinder, uh, Savage Worlds, I think is up there pretty good. Um, let's see if I can find that. <clears throat> Does it break it down more into editions, or you know, like uh, fifth edition or fourth? Yeah, edition? yeah, it's broken it up basically by what we call our rule set. So, yeah. so like it'll say five e or four e or or whatever, and then you've got people's own spinoff versions. So that's where it gets a little bit muddy because uh, you know people might audit it, you know their own. Version of a rule set. Parse their own, yeah, gotcha. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'd have to look around a little bit more, but I could definitely send that to you. Can have it yeah, back. No problem, but it's, yeah. it's been out on like Ian World a couple times. There's always a big discussion there. I think the Roll Twenty folks normally push out their numbers around the same sort of time frame, or uh, you know, it seems like they do it in response to ours, or, or vice versa, or whatever. So yeah. it's kind of interesting to see you know the two perspectives of, of like what people are playing the most, but. They, they overlap quite a bit, I and mean, we see a lot of the same sort of stuff. Oh, yeah. So, you know, you mentioned, uh, you know, Fantasy Grounds is on Steam. Now, with Steam and, and you know, like people like myself that, that have the standalone version, is, is there going to be anything in the future that is going to allow you to <coughs> basically take your existing account and link it into Steam to where yeah. you can, you know, link it into your Steam account and use it that way? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, it's already... Uh, there basically. So uh, what we did when we rolled out um, when we rolled it out to Steam, we used the third-party license key. So what that allows us to do is basically um, we send them a ton of license keys, uh, and then they uh, basically sell. Whenever somebody buys one, they hand one out basically uh, up from that from that pool of licenses. And so in addition to that. Um, we sell licenses already just directly on our website and on RPG Now as well. And so I collect these on a regular basis and about once every one to two months, I'll take all of those license keys and I send them to Steam and they're set up for free activation. 
So <clears throat> you can basically go to Steam, use your existing license key. If you bought, uh, I think the last batch I did was maybe on August 23rd or something. On the Steam forums, I've got basically uh, how to activate an existing license. There's a thread on there about that. So if you go to the, uh, you go to the fantasy grounds, you go to the community hub and the discussions, look for that topic, and that'll tell me, that'll tell you the, how to do it. And it'll tell you the last time that I pushed the license is over. And every license purchased up through, I think, August 23rd of 2015 is already in the system. So if you've ever bought a full license or an ultimate license um, or an upgrade up from the light to the full back when we had that option, then that will be recognized on Steam and will activate it as if you own it on Steam. Now, all Steam is really doing when you launch it is it's just basically launching the same program, but Steam is Steam counts it as, oh, you're running the game Fantasy Grounds. And, and so, uh, you know, you can then buy DLC from Steam, or you can buy it from, you know, our website. You know, we try to price match it, but occasionally people will see that, you know, depending on which country they're in, sometimes uh, it's actually cheaper to buy it on Steam because of the way they, they they don't do like a straight currency conversion. They actually have like some algorithms that they run to figure out like cost of living in different areas. It's, it's pretty cool, actually. Oh, very good. So you ready to take some uh, some questions from? Uh all sure. of the viewers, yeah, quite a few people in here. So, let's see. Uh, let's see some questions, y'all. What do you guys have? <clears throat> Someone said Star Frontiers. Also, I remember playing that back in the in the middle '80s as a kid. That was uh, an interesting game. Let's see. I know a couple people were asking about uh, the pricing for the for the new fantasy. Uh, Grounds and you know talked about the Kickstarter and whatnot. So I have a a question from a uh, 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 Damien. I, I don't know if this is something that that you'd be able to answer, and you don't have to answer this, but uh, it is. Uh, there was I don't even think Damien. It was uh, something about what was discussed at the Wizards of the Coast meeting that you, <laughs> that you had uh, attended last month or or a month ago. So I don't know if yeah. that's something that you can that's really just probably I. I... I'm pretty sure that's probably. So. Have you ever seen uh, Willy Wonka in the Chocolate Factory? <laughs> you know the guy at the end of it where he's like, uh, he tries to buy the Gobstopper recipe, and it's all a. Uh, this guy's a plant. Whoever asked that question, I'm sure they're a plant to, to see if I'm going to leak, uh, you know, top secret information here so that they'll uh, knock me off here. I so think. what were so, you doing? Uh, <laughs> they're trying to purchase Wizards of the Coast. <laughs> Because <laughs> yeah. I'm going to, uh, when I hit the Powerball, I'm going over there with a blank check and saying, how yeah, much, guys? That's funny, because I've seen there's been some posts over the years about, what would you do if you won a $500 million Powerball, you know, whenever it gets real high? And I've seen people often say, oh, I'd buy Wizards of the Coast, or I'd buy Games Workshop, or, you know, whatever. <laughs> yeah. so, uh, no, I mean, what what we did there, we talked a lot about, um, you know, what I can share is, is, you know, nothing that's top secret or anything, but we talked about what are, what are the next kind of story cycles that are coming out? Yeah. Uh, what sort of products are, are in the pipelines and, and how far along and what the release schedule is going to look like so we can kind of have everything in place and be ready for those to land because um, it takes a fair amount of time to get something out the door and to get something out the door simultaneously with the release of the print product is, is a challenge as well uh, because on top of uh, <clears throat> sometimes those products go through, like for instance, the, the Green Ronin product, the Out of the Abyss, uh, that's the most recent one. So what happened with that one in the background was that, uh, you know, it's going back and forth between Green Ronin and Wizards of the Coast to figure out editing and to get it all laid out perfectly, you know, the way that, that everybody wants it to read and, and that sort of stuff. And then once that happens, then they finally kick it out to the printer, they send us a copy of that as well. And it's in a real raw format. It's like huge, like, um, and it's not—it's not really easy to work with. It's not ne nearly as nice as like a PDF or anything like that. Yes, we can get to a PDF, but uh, with all the like raw files and stuff, it's like that—that that file is like six gig worth of data wow. that gets dumped down to us, and it's in—and it's in an InDesign format, which I'm not super super proficient with, with all these like linked attachments and all kinds of stuff. So anyway, so we have to work from—we work from that sort of a system to grab all the stuff, and then we end up doing a fair amount of like manipulation of graphics and so forth too because you know a lot of the graphics are used uh, for print and for a print medium Massive so they'll, they'll files, be uh, yeah like mask and stuff like that so that it, the picture fits in nicely with the text and all that sort of stuff and so we have to kind of undo a lot of that sort of stuff to push it out so that has to happen 
Then we have to kick it in through um, an approval process with Wizards of the Coast that goes through. It's, it's like a Hasbro system that basically they run through it and, and look at that. And then that's got like people from all these different departments. So they're really involved with the process, basically. And so they go through and they check various things. They check it for art. They check it for legal. They check it for uh, you know, the D&D teams. You know, a couple people there check it. The branding people check it to make sure we, we follow the branding guidelines properly, that sort of thing. Uh, and then on top of that, we also have our internal people that are checking it, and we've gotten a little bit better about that. First couple of products we had, we maybe pushed out a little bit rougher than we would have liked, and then uh, thankfully the community has given us a big list of things that we, need, we needed to fix, and we've gone back and fixed them. But uh, <clears throat> what we've done is we've, some of those, some of the people that were really good about putting together a really nice detailed list of how to follow and, and fix, you know, find issues basically. Uh, I reached out to you know some of those people and, and they've helped with like the out of the abyss, and so that all happened before it ever got released out, and so nice. that happened went through a couple cycles there before we even sent it over to Wizards of the Coast this time, and then um, that approval process takes a while, and then finally it gets approved, and then then we're ready to go, and we were able to release you know on the proper day, you know as soon as it released. I got France, it at twelve fifteen. Yeah, we were out there <laughs> right after midnight. Went, boom, boom, the uh, oh yeah, I, I was there. I was. I stayed up late just so I could, just so I could get yeah. it because I was like, man, am I gonna have to scan this damn book and make my own module? Or I was like, thank you for making my life easy, and I, I just, just pulled the trigger on it. But I got, I got to see another. Oh, Sword Coast Adventures Guide is out there too, so that's uh, one that we're working on right now, and, and we got a lot of work left to do on that one. But it's good to know, like we always have to know, like really early on to figure out what sort of stuff's going yeah. on, because some of these things right now we've been fairly lucky with it, but you know, oftentimes when a new product comes out, sometimes there's a new game mechanic or something like that that ends up being really, really important that we have to do a code change for as well. So. Um, anytime it, it goes above and beyond just content to something you know more unique, then there's like a little wrinkle that we'll have to figure out. Okay, well, how do we do this? Like the you know, DMG, uh, basically, pretty much, right? DMG because is, of the the rule changes and whatnot with mana points and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that was another question. Uh, is there any kind of like a timeline on the on the Dungeon Master's Guide, and are there going to be uh, additional rule changes like the spell points and uh, basically whatever is in you know all of the the extra actions and whatnot, all of the the magic items? Are they going to be drag and drop and adjust stats and whatnot for you know just like everything else in Five E? Yeah, so we have a whole bunch of stuff that we want to do with the DMG, and uh, and so I'm going to be able to get some of those things. And, in, in place before release, uh, but we're probably not going to get all of them in, in the initial push. So uh, we'll have a few kind of optional rules that we think are probably going to be the most popular ones. We might have a few of those things in there. Uh, the big thing that I think we're going to have early on is that uh, <clears throat> you know it's got the content from the DMG, so it's got you know it's got a couple new I think like uh, classes and, and stuff like that in there, um, but it's got uh, lots of random tables and and uh, that sort of thing. Those are all loaded in. The magic items, uh, the big thing that I really kind of think is, is cool that should be getting wrapped up, I think, in about a week uh, more development time to finish that up. Uh, and I think at that point we'll probably push it through uh, our kind of community resources, and that might take another week or two probably to, to really hash out before we release it, though. So... Uh, we're probably still about a month out, I think, on that one. Uh, but what that's going to do is the item forge is, is something that I really, really, really want to have in place, uh, and that's just going to be, uh, you know, just nice to have in general. So, if you look at the magic items and how they're statted out in the actual DMG, it'll have a lot of magic items. It'll say, you know, like a simple example is like a plus two magic sword, for instance, or uh, you know, a sort of you know, icy blast or whatever. Or, or a we it'll say plus two magic weapon. It won't even say sword. And so the idea, obviously, is that you take any weapon that you want. I mean, a human would look at it and say, oh, so yeah, just throw that on top of any weapon, you know, and, and it'll work. But, you know, computers are dumb, so we got to tell them every single thing to do. So, uh, you know, at, at that point, what we're going to see is that you'll have a list of, of abilities and magical enhancements that you'll be able to, to dump into kind of one side and you'll be able to take your your items and dump it into the other one. Nice. And so what I really like is you'd be able to spit out a whole like uh, 
almost like a set of magic items that you could even create. Yeah, just like and, custom and stuff. Like, wow. Yeah, yeah, and you can forge, you can basically forge magic items by kind of mixing some of the ingredients in it, yeah. and it'll spit out. So you take, okay, I'm, I'm going to take the, uh, you know, the, the coal property and the plus two magical weapon property, and I want to stick that on my scythe. Then now you got a plus two cold magical site, you know, Man, that, awesome. that spits out. So you know, it's it's simple in theory, but it's you know just getting that all to work real smoothly and, and to have a, a nice intuitive interface that someone won't have to read a manual. They'll just be able to pull it up and say, oh, I know how to work this and, and use it right away. You know, that that's sort of amazing. thing. Uh, that's that's definitely going to be there before we release it. Some of the other things uh, probably going to be a little bit farther down the road, but you know we'll keep enhancing that too. How about uh, how about for dynamic lighting? Have you have you have you worked much with the dynamic lighting yet? And is it dynamic lighting? We've really pushed that back to after Unity because okay. uh, Unity's got such better capacity for handling all the graphics sort of stuff too. Mm -hmm. Plus, we need to make sure it's going to work when we start doing all that stuff with the isometric you know thing too. Because then when you start talking about in 3D space, it's a it's a completely different animal than than just blotting out like. You know, yeah. uh, a two D plane basically. Um, so we want to make sure that, that all works well. Plus, we we want to make sure that we do it in, in a way that doesn't increase the uh, DM prep time too much. You know, so we want to play around with some some kind of we've got a couple cool sort of ideas that I think will help with that. Um, but we'll have to you know do a lot more prototyping once we get to Unity to figure out you know if we can really get that to work the way we want. But we'll definitely have dynamic lighting uh, guaranteed. It's it's going to be in the program once we get to Unity. Um, may or may not be in the very first release, but yeah. it's it's pretty high on the list because that's one of the things people really really want to see. Um, so so that's going to be in there. And then uh, the big thing is I want to still be able to do the same sort of stuff we do today where we take a printed product uh, or you know a PDF version of a product so if you buy that for whatever game you run if it has a 2D map that you'll be able to very easily set up dynamic lighting on a map yeah. and um, you know, so we're looking at some things like actually I don't want to I don't want to probably talk too much about it because I don't want to give any any of our competitors any ideas but I've got yeah, some good ideas on yeah it. don't don't you don't have to do that man that's that sounds good man now about uh, uh, with you know, there's a couple questions about dropping armor uh, in 5e to adjust armor class. Is that going to be uh, anything that's going to be possible down the line with five with the 5e rule set? Uh, yeah, that's a good that's a good question, and I don't know. I don't want to sp speak on that one right, right away because I'm not sure if John and and, uh, and Zeus have, have figured that part out. But I know that's one that we've talked about a fair amount. I don't know if they've got it planned in the in the near term or not, but. Um, I'll make a note to ask him about that later on. I'll have to get back to to you guys on that one. And uh, one more thing, a couple other questions have come up about uh, uh, having like an interface inside Fantasy Grounds where you can use those uh, tile sets from like DungeonArts.com, from Greg Taylor, you know, from the from the other artist websites where you can basically build maps with tile sets. Yeah, unfortunately, that's going to be another Unity piece. So okay. that and then the layers. Uh, that goes hand in hand with layers, basically. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, so you want to be able to have layers, and and that builds it all builds on itself to to get to being able to do more three D type environments. You know, I, I love all those games like X, the old XCOM games and all that sort of stuff too, where you had uh, well even the new one too, where you yeah. can basically tell which layer you're on and you can go up onto the roof of buildings and stuff, and and so. You know, I, I could definitely see us doing some really pretty cool stuff once we get to Unity on that, where you have, you know, all right, so here's here's your map, here's uh, you know level one of all the buildings, level nice. two, three. That's like amazing. That kind of stuff would be so sweet. Here, here, take my take my wallet here. <laughs> take my yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, I think uh, let's see. Try to. I don't want to keep you keep you too late. So, you know, and I do appreciate all of your time and appreciate the information that you've given us about about Unity and, you know, all of the, you know, the history of Fantasy Grounds. Really good, man. And I'm glad that, uh, I'm glad that I gave uh, Fantasy Grounds another shot out there. So, because I was one of those, you know, people that, you know, purchased it, you know, years ago and, and yeah. wasn't very happy with it. And now it's, man, I, I'd, I'm not going back to any other programs. I just I just enjoy it too much and 
you know, uh, I appreciate your time, man. Is there anything else you want to, you want to say? No, I mean, I, I just, uh, you know, likewise, I appreciate everybody like you in the community who basically is, is out there, you know, spreading the good word of, of what we're doing with Fantasy Grounds and, um, you know, bringing people in. The people, all the DMs that run the uh, convention games. FG Con, uh, yeah. yeah th those guys are phenomenal. And now there's, uh, there's now three different conventions that are running. So there's one every single month now. Uh, and, and that's just very humbling that you have people that, that invest that much of their time and effort to, to basically promote something just for the pure love of it, you know. So you've got FGCon is coming up next month, <clears throat> and then you've got, uh, uh, so it's FG-Con.com, uh, I believe, uh, is the website. So check that out. It's all free to play for any of, any of your listeners who have never tried Fantasy Grounds. You don't even uh, need to buy a license. You just get the demo copy, and then what we do is we... For those who are not familiar with the conventions, we they're kind of slated for like a four-hour slot kind of game, one-off. Normally, the pre-generated pre-generated characters are provided. The GM will run it. You connect to them. Every GM will be promoted to be an ultimate license GM at that point in time during the entire length of the convention. We do this every single convention, and then uh, following that, so in October is FGCon, in November is FG Days, which is just a single uh, day at a time, 24 hours basically, it's worldwide, uh, and so that one's going to be a similar sort of a setup, and then uh, following that, back in December I think is the next time it's, it's scheduled, it's called Gamer Geek End, and it just finished uh, in September, That they just finished their very first one, and they're setting up for the next one already, and getting that all like lined up, and, and so that's you can try multiple virtual tabletops for Gamer Geek in, but Fancy Grounds it featured very prominently there too. Yeah. Uh, same sort of setup, so you know we pro promote everybody up during that period of time so that it's it's completely free to play. So if you have any gamer people that you guys just used to game with that are still they haven't moved into the digital you know world of gaming yet with with role playing games, um, invite them to one of those things and see if you can get them to just try it out because everybody that I've ever shown. Fantasy grounds that that I've actually brought in and run them through the games, they're always like amazed that oh, I would have never thought that I could play, you know, D and D online and that it would be that it would be yeah. this smooth and that it would run as well as it does in, in person. In fact, it runs better because it, you know things happen a lot faster. Especially you're talking about D and D fourth edition earlier and how all the conditions and all that kind of stuff. I mean, it does everything uh, for you. <clears throat> yeah, high level Pathfinder play and, and stuff too. That's uh, a single game, you know, session in real life can can be one combat, and then here you you throw it in fantasy grounds, and the thing just flies through it, you know, a lot faster. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I think just doing what you're doing, where you're introducing people to it, and just you know, raising the awareness, that sort of stuff is invaluable. It helps our community grow. It helps bring more people into the community that are that are talented and and uh, you know, good DMs and good players and. Uh, and then we also end up getting just a lot of amazing artists and tech, uh, technology, you know, gurus out there too, which contribute in, in all kinds of ways that you couldn't even imagine. Yeah. Well, uh, I could probably show you guys a little bit before I. Knock uh oh, off. I love it. <laughs> you mentioned. Let me see if I can pull it up here without. All right. Something. So. Don't get in trouble uh, now, man. Moon Wizard. No, 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 no. I'm just gonna <laughs> share. I might get in trouble with John. I'm giving away some information. Oh, so John, okay. get me. A list of the the new features that are going into development right now, and so let me see if I can share a few of these here. So, where did it go? Let's see if I can find it now. Mm, okay, I think this is it. Yeah, he basically sends me walls of text sometimes, which are like uh, oh, that's yeah, what right. coders do, man. Yeah, it's uh. There we go. We'll see if that works. Okay. So, I'm just going to read off a few things here that jump out at me. So, there's an Adventure League extension for 5e, so you can, uh, you know, track your Adventure League stuff, um, oh. gameplay. So, that'll be something you can add in. Nice. Uh, extra inspiration slots. That'll be an, ex an extension. Uh, Call of Cthulhu integrates 7e uh, extension for Call of Cthulhu. <clears throat> Uh, there's some token widget scaling issues for high res tokens and some of the effects and statuses and widgets and stuff like uh, looking a little bit weird if your token was high res. <clears throat> so that should be fixed. Uh, let's see. 
Uh, we're doing some pretty cool stuff with pins. I, I don't know if he's ready to share that yet. It may not make it into the next batch, but um, some really cool features, I think, with uh, being able to share content a little bit better and actually having like public and private pins. Oh that my the gosh. Sound on that. So that'll be pretty sweet, I think, once we figure out you know the best way to, to do that. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Oh, one of my favorites, the uh, the language feature for the chat window. I don't know if you've ever looked at that at all before. Right now, it's an extension. Yeah. Uh, that'll be built in. So for all people that have never tried it, it's going to wow. be it's going to be built into it by by default, which is pretty sweet. Um, so we're working on a few things. We're trying to get some of the new fonts for uh, fifth edition, and there's awesome. some new fonts coming out in the Adventures Guide too. So getting that sort of stuff in. So every time they release these new kind of cool settings and that sort of stuff. They, they introduce new fonts and new spoken languages and stuff that we'll be able to, to roll out. That would be pretty sweet. Nice. I see uh, another, uh, yeah. you know, uh, there was one question that i seen before I forget about it. It was uh, actually to do with the nighttime and daytime cycles that you actually have within Fantasy Grounds, which is amazing. Is there any way to add weather cycles as well as, you know, sunshiny to, to rainy and whatnot? Oh, uh, no, that would be pretty sweet, though. So... There's an idea for you then. It is. I want to make a note of that. <laughs> <laughs> you got, uh, you know, a hundred heads are, are, are better than one. That's what I always say. Uh, well, you know, somebody the ideas. You, know? you asked just a second ago. You mentioned about uh, and, and uh, animations and doing stuff like that and doing particle effects. So you could do some pretty cool little particle effects where it's actually raining on your on your desktop. That'd be pretty tight, actually. That would be pretty sweet. Yeah, have have leaves blow through the blow across the screen when you're like traveling through the woods or something. That'd be kind of cool. We'll have to figure out some cool stuff we can do with that. Uh, Take more yeah. money now, man. Take it. Ah. <laughs> so I'm seeing, uh, there's so many stuff. I mean, we've got a ton of stuff for core RPG enhancements, um, math and dice expressions within brackets, uh, being evaluated within tables. So that's kind of a cool new feature. So you know, a lot of times it'll say like. Uh, you know, on a random encounter table, two d six of you know whatever. So we can maybe even have it roll the dice there too and tell you how many are appearing. So it doesn't just say you know two d six goblins. Um, you know, that's something that we could probably do some really pretty cool stuff there. Let's see. Suspicious bagman in chat says this guy is already wrecking my wallet. <laughs> <laughs> I I Love it. <laughs> uh, Oh, so here's one of the things you mentioned about the, the Dungeon Master Guide. So diagonal movement in 5th edition, uh, there's optional yeah, rules. The Pathfinder, yeah. You, know, you do it uh, where it's like every... every uh, you know, what is it? 5 and 10. It'll, it'll uh, rotate 5 and 10, every diagonal square. Yeah, so you know, it kind of alternates like that. Or do you want to do like uh, just... Diagonal distance is one counts as one square on movement, so that's the other option. So that'll probably be a toggle of preference sort of thing. Uh, let's see, classes with more than one hit die per level are now supported. Hmm. I don't know which one that one is actually. Think about that. Hmm. All right, but yeah, lots of fourth edition stuff, fifth edition stuff. I see uh, Pathfinder 3.5 edition stuff in there. Uh, Call of Cthulhu. And then some more features that devs can, uh, you know, program towards as well. That is all, you know, stuff uh, that Savage something. World's bloodstains, man. It's all about Savage World's death bloodstains. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I've got a few things I got to push out for Savage Worlds too. I've got a big like running list of check boxes. It's so funny because I have like, I don't know if I can show you guys this real quick. Let's make sure I'm anything major, major. Oh, let me cover up this one part. <laughs> There we go. Uh, all right, so this is how this is how I work sometimes. This is this is hilarious. I don't know if you guys can see that. So uh, I do this sort of stuff every day, and so I just basically it's kind of like you know, in elementary school when you would say check a box if you like me or not. <laughs> so so this is how I work because otherwise yeah. my list gets too long and I'm like I have to go all old school and I'm like okay what am I going to do today? That's what I do too, man. I'm, I'm the same way. To, set a list and I just try to check off stuff as much as possible. So I have some stuff that's been sitting on my list a little bit too long I need to get to, but uh, but yeah, I've, I've got a few things here. Necessary Evil, it's got a new updated version that's going to be rolling out pretty soon. Um, some new token sets popping out, I think. And yeah, 
I've got a couple other things I can't quite share yet that I'm working on some super super exciting stuff that is uh, man I, just, I can't wait to talk, and talk to you guys about this other stuff too but well let me know when you want to come back on man and I'll have you on any anytime right. so cool. Cool. for real we haven't been uh, standing still so that's for sure we've been we've been working to the wee wee hour of the night yeah. every day <laughs> I, I see there's always always updates and you know you can tell that you know you guys care about fantasy grounds which is you have to have that to be successful you know and I, and I can tell just by the way you talk to you know as you present yourself with with fantasy grounds I can tell that you love the product and I know that you care about it and yeah. that is that that's awesome you got me man I mean it's uh you know I'm 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 hooked on it now so and yeah. a, a lot of the the people in chat have really liked what they they've seen from from me using it you know being a total noob and some you know putting 20 gig worth of assets into fantasy grounds and then it not working i was like what in the heck is going on and then one guy's like dude you got way too many assets in there <laughs> you were clogging <laughs> up the man. so after i after i took out 20 gig of assets uh yeah. fantasy grounds work perfect again yeah well you know that's that's one of our known issues we got to solve too you know it's uh the, some of the architectural decisions work great uh mm-hmm. up to a point but then you know Modern modern day usage, people expect to be able to do that. You know, there's there should be no reason why you couldn't do exactly that and, and have it work. So we've got to fix that sort of stuff. We just have to quit loading everything into memory uh, when you first launch. You know, so that's it's not necessary to do it that way. So, but it, it involves us changing some of the core engine you know decisions that were made and, and you know doing that to to make it more robust moving forward. But it's coming. That's awesome, man. Well. Doug, it was nice to, to meet you and hope to have you on again anytime you want to come on and, and uh, talk about FG, man. You're more than welcome to. The floor will be yours, man. So. Great. All right, Great. man. Well, thanks again. Right. I appreciate having you, everybody. Uh, appreciated having you. And I uh, wish you nothing but the best for Fantasy Grounds, man. I really do. Great. Great. All right, thanks man. to everybody for listening as well and for the questions. Appreciate it. All right, man. Take it easy. All right. Later, man. All right.